I'm going to call the title of this message this morning, The Sons of God. The Sons of God Arising. That includes the daughters of God. See, the, son, the term sons of God isn't really gender. Uh, it's not about that. It's talking about m- mature sons and daughters of God. If, uh, if, uh, if I can be the bride of Christ, then Madeline can be a son of God. Right? So, so um, in the last few weeks, we were talking previously in weeks, we we're looking at the counsel of the Lord on how to live at the end of the age. That's what we've been looking at for weeks. Agreed? There's signs that Jesus gave to make us know what time it is. In fact, Jesus rebuked the people of his day for not knowing what time it was. He said, you can look at the weather and tell what the weather's going to be by the sky. He said, you're hypocrites. Don't you know how to tell what time this is? He was talking about spiritually the kingdom of God. So as believers... We're told to watch and pray always, have our waist girded and our lamps burning. We should know what time it is. And we know that we're drawing near to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there's specific counsel and admonitions and commandments from the Lord and from his holy apostles on how to live. And the wise will listen to the counsel of the Lord and do it. That's going to make us have a good experience at the end of the age. There's going to be some people, as we draw near to the second coming of the Lord, two dynamics are going on. The day the Lord returns is called, it's called the day of the Lord. It's called in Malachi 4 and in other places, the great and terrible day of the Lord. That was great for those that love the Lord. and It's terrible for those that don't. So is the season preceding the coming of the Lord. And several weeks ago, I have it. It's on YouTube. It's also on our website, ShekinahWorship.com. The messages of the series that I did called The Culmination of the Age. I don't remember what week it was, week six or seven. I talked about this is the best time right now is the best time in the history of the world for Christians to be alive. If, if. We walk passionately after God. And I explain that from the scripture. It's the best time for supernatural provision, guidance, protection, for the maturing of the body of Christ. It's the best time to be alive. So we looked at some of the counsel the Lord gave. He said, um, for example, Peter said, seeing that all these things are going to end this way, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot, blameless. John the Beloved in 1 John 2, 28 said, abide in him so that when he appears, we'll have confidence and not shrink back at his coming. Jesus said, pray always, Luke 21, 36, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that are coming to stand before the Son of Man. So here's another counsel we looked at, and it's what we want to launch off from today in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 21. Paul writes, see then that you walk circumspectly. That means with your eyes open, paying attention, knowing what's going on around you. He said, walk that way, not as fools, but wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We're living in evil days. But God tells us how to redeem the time. Redeeming the time doesn't mean become more anxious, more frantic, and try to hurry up. In fact, you'll waste time doing that. You become less efficient. Redeeming the time, he said, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That's the first thing we must know, is when you know the will of God, you can be at peace. You can redeem the time by methodically, day in and day out, doing the will of God. You're not in a hurry. You're not stressed. You're not anxious. You're not racing. But you're redeeming the time because you're not wasting your time on things that are not the will of God. Because only what's done in the Lord, led by the Lord and by his grace, has eternal value. So he said, redeem the time. The days are evil. Understand the will of God. Then he's going to break down the whole rest of the chapter, uh, chapter 5 and all through chapter 6. 
It's instructions that if we heed those, if we pay attention to those, if we do what the Word of God says, we will be redeeming the time. So he said, know what the will of God is. And he said, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. And then he tells us clearly how to be filled in an ongoing way. For example, you may have come in here, maybe you felt a little bit dry, but maybe after 45 minutes of worship, you felt full of the Holy Spirit. How many felt more, how many felt more filled with the presence of God after worship than before? Let me see your hand. Okay, so now he's going to give us a secret. He said, there's a way to stay filled. You can go in your prayer closet. You can read the Bible. You can spend time with God and you become filled. When you do that, when you spend time in the word in prayer, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. But he said, be being filled. So it's an ongoing tense in the Greek. And he tells us how. Singing, making melody, songs, hymns. Spiritual songs, hymns are singing the word. Uh, in Colossians, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with songs and hymns. In other words, sing the word to God. Singing, making melody, singing the word. And then he said, giving thanks to God always for everything. This must be practiced. It must be cultivated and I do intend, I told you this before, I want to come back to this whole thing because I want us to get equipped as a body to really walk in this. It's not enough to hear a message and say, amen, yes, sing and make melody. We better learn how to do it and learn how to practice it and implement it in our life so we can stay full of the Holy Spirit. Because when we're full of the Holy Spirit, we redeem the time. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you have the mind of Christ. When you're full of the Holy Spirit, you have the anointing and power of God to do His will. When we're empty, we're not redeeming the time. When we're full of the Spirit, we're redeeming the time. Then he said the way to stay filled with the Holy Spirit is be submitted to one another in the fear of God. Right? Husbands, love your wife. That's how you submit to God. Love your wife. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Children, honor and obey your parents, employers, employees, all of that. So that's how we redeem the time. Now, the week, last week, we did an overview of the book of Ephesians. I went through the whole book in an hour and nine minutes. From chapter one to chapter six. And I want to do something similar, but not exactly the same. I want to look at the purpose that God has for your life and for mine. Let's all stop. We've all got stuff going on in our lives. We've got jobs, careers. Uh, we've got kids to raise. We've got families. Some people are single. They, we've got stuff going on in our life. We need to stop, draw back, get with the Lord, find out what the big picture is. We can't be so caught up in the day-to-day -day grind that we don't know where we're going or what we're doing. Because if you do that five years, 10 years, 15 years goes by. And what do you got for? Uh, I, I, I made more money and I got a house. You know, we need to find out what does God want from us? What's his plan? The redeeming the time is getting fully immersed in that. So I still have my family, I still work, I still raise my kids, I still go to school, I still do all that stuff, but, while I, but I'm doing that while I'm in the plan of God. Amen. And something of eternal value is going on. And that's what we want to look at in the book of Ephesians. The eternal purpose of God. Because if we don't understand that, we can miss it. And then get to the end of our life and find out we didn't fulfill really what God sent us here to do. So I want to talk about that. And it's all through the book of Ephesians. It's in other books also. Let me give you an example because I'm going to go back over Ephesians, Lord willing, God help me. And I'm going to extract a few bullet points from each chapter and show us how there's one theme through the whole book. And the end of the book culminates in how to walk in it. 
I'll give you an example of the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, and I believe the writer was Paul. You don't have to believe that. But I believe it was Paul. The entire theme of the book of Hebrews is to compare the superiority, to show the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ over Moses. Over his house, over the house of Moses. That the superiority of the priesthood of Jesus over the priesthood under Moses. Of the new covenant is better than the old. The whole book is doing that from the beginning. It's comparing. To which of the angels did he say, you're my son? He's saying Jesus is superior to the angels. Moses was faithful all, in all of his house, but Jesus' house is greater. He says, he goes through the book of, of Hebrews. He said, the Old Testament priests, they would offer sacrifices until they came to the end of their life. And then they would die and another priest would take over. But he said, now we have a priest that never dies. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. So he'd say, in the old covenant, there was a blood of bulls and goats, but it could only cover sin. But now we're redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb. So the whole book, now through the book, as he's comparing the old covenant with the new, he's, he makes a couple of comments. He said, no one by the law could ever be made perfect. He said these things could, they were only a type and a shadow of the reality of what was to come, the Lord Jesus Christ. It was like a band-aid until the cure came. So he said, now, so the whole book, Jesus is better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Moses' house. He's a priest that never dies. His blood is better than the blood of bulls and goats. But again, a couple of times as he's doing that, he's saying, and in the old, you couldn't be made perfect. Now, when he gets to the end of the book of Hebrews, what is his point? What is his point in telling that Jesus is better? His priesthood is better. It says in Hebrews, I believe chapter seven, we're under a better covenant, better promises. What's his point in saying that? He finishes it at the end of the book by saying, in Hebrews chapter 13, the very end of the book, verse 20 and 21. Now, now that he's laid out his case, Jesus is better, his blood is better, his covenant is better. He said, now, may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work, working in you, God working in you. The law worked on the outside. God's grace works on the inside. May the God of grace, of peace, who brought up the Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you perfect in every good work, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. What's he saying? Under the law, under human sweat, under all of the old covenant, nobody could be made perfect. But now we're under the gospel of grace. We're redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Christ ever lives to make intercession. He's with us. He's in us. May the God who rose Jesus from the dead work in us and change us. And he's, he's now saying, God can make you perfect. That's what he's saying. And I know that's blasphemy to the religious traditional mind. Oh, we can't be perfect. Give me a verse for it. Why did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect? Well, he meant this. No, he's what he meant. He said, even as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, now, that, now that on it, if I didn't know and have confidence in the grace of God, I would faint right now. Oh my God, I can't do that. Now, if you're thinking, I can't do that, you're 100% right. This is not about what we can do. This is about what our Savior can do. 
It's what about the God who raised Jesus from the dead can do. And we have to believe it. We have to believe the grace of God. Now, perfect, and I like John Wesley's definition of perfect. He walked, I believe John Wesley walked in it. You can read all the accounts of him, of his life and his ministry. He walked in what I believe is Christian perfection. He said perfection is not uh, that we never make a mistake in judgment. To do that, you would have to be omniscient. And only God is omniscient. It doesn't mean you don't, you, that you never make a mistake in judgment. Perfection in God's eyes is that every motive of the heart springs from love. How many know we can do that? Yes, we can. God is in us. Romans 5, 5. The love of God is poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you think, I know, I know how the traditional mindset is. We all compromise. I'm, not, we, I'm saying we all. I don't want to. I don't want anything to do with compromise. I want to be as clean and pure as possible by the grace of God. But I know how the common traditional Christian, well, God understands. We, none of us are perfect. We can't be. So we compromise. Baloney. That's not the gospel that's in the New Testament. This is not about how, this is not about our willpower or our resolve. It's about our faith in a saving God. And to know that God expects when we get to the end of our journey, none of us knows how long our journey will be. Jack and Grace have been blessed to live into their 80s. But some of us may only live to our 30s or 40s or 50s or 20s. We don't know. But when we get to the end of our journey, God is going to expect Christ-likeness. Read the scripture. Every verse, almost every verse that speaks about the second coming of Jesus speaks about the saints being blameless before he comes. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless Unto the coming of the Lord. Faithful is he who calls you. He also will do it. 1 John 2, 28. Little children abide in him so that when he appears, you'll have confidence and not shrink back at his coming. 1 John 2, 6. If anyone says that he abides in him, he ought to walk even as he walked. So God's not asking us to never make mistakes and all that. What he wants is he wants to change us. He wants to sanctify us so that what's coming out of our heart is love for God and love for people. Amen. And he can do that. He's well able to do it. If we're willing and if we believe, he'll do it. So that's what I want to talk about, the theme. Now, if you look through the New Testament and you see the burden on the heart of the apostles, it's with these apostolic prayers. It's about 25 or 26 of the apostolic prayers. If you look at the burden that was in the heart of the apostles, it was always for the church to be made holy, to be filled with love, to be sanctified, to walk worthy of the gospel, to walk in unity. Those are all the prayers. If you look at the burden, you look at Colossians 1.28. Paul said, Him we preach. How many messages are preached all over America and they're not about him? He said, him we preach. Warning and teaching every man. Where are the warnings? Him we, teach, him we preach, warning and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect, complete, lacking nothing in Christ. And then he goes on to say, and we're working according to the mighty working of God's power in us to do this. Here's the apostolic burden. Galatians 4.19, my little children for whom I travail again until Christ is formed in you. Here's the purpose for our life. Romans chapter 8 says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who are the called according to his purpose. 
For whom he called, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first of many brethren. So that's the great purpose of God. The great purpose of God is to cause us to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And to simplify it, it means love. It means love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the image of Jesus. And uh, God has an eternal purpose for us in the ages to come. And how often do we think about that? Probably not much. I remember seeing a, a video of Francis Chan, and I really like Francis Chan. And he had a 100-foot rope on the platform. Uh, you know, a thick one, probably a three-quarter inch thick rope. And he'd put red tape around the last four inches of it. And there was 100 feet of rope on the platform. He said, this four inches represents our 80 years on earth. And this rest of this rope re represents eternity. He said, most people spend the first 50 years trying to get everything they can so they can live the last 20 or 30 comfortable. Never thinking about the rest of this rope. We spend all our time and energy focused on these four inches right here. How we live in this four inches of red, and for some people it's one inch, two inch. We don't know. How we live there depends on how we're going to live the rest of forever. I'm not just talking about heaven or hell. I'm talking about in God's kingdom. For the purposes that God has for us to fulfill, he's, he needs us to be conformed into the image of Christ. To, he has plans for us in the ages to come. Read Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 6 says that we're seated in the heavenlies with Christ. That speaks of our, the gift of legal righteousness seated with Christ. But verse 7 tells why. So that in the ages to come, everyone say ages to come. Ages to come. Does anybody know about the ages to come? I don't. I only know about the millennium. That's a thousand years. And then there's time after that. But in the ages to come, God may show the exceeding kindness and lavish his grace upon us. God's, God wants to, in the ages to come, make a demonstration of your life to all the rest of his creation by lavishing kindness and grace upon you for the ages to come. Anyway, so, to get back to our theme that's in Ephesians. The theme that's in Ephesians is the, the eternal purpose of God. Our salvation isn't just to get us forgiven, our sins forgiven, and then God's out there as a force to help solve all my problems. It's a very shallow Christianity. It's a very self-centered We've underestimated the effects of the fall. The fall made man completely self-centered. And Jesus is the center of the universe. He's the center of all creation. Read Revelation 4.11. For by him, through him, he created all things. By him and for him and for his good pleasure. We were made for him. And um, he's the center and he loves us more than we love us. And he's infinitely more wise than we are. And he wants to fill us with every good thing. But we have to trust him and his will to get there. So there's two kinds of Christianity today. There's the real Christianity that says, when I come to Christ, I surrender my life to him. He owns me. I've been purchased by his blood. He loves me more than I could love myself. I believe that and I give myself to him in faith. To do with me as he wills. Then there's another false kind of Christianity. that I come and I receive the Lord as my Savior. And he's a lifestyle enhancement blessing. I'm now not going to hell. 
And God is there to fix all my problems and make sure that I have a good life. That's a shallow, that's not the real gospel. God will fix all your problems. That's just the icing on the cake. The biggest problem is we're not conformed to the image of Christ. That's what he wants to fix. Anyway, so let's try to go through this in a few minutes and look at the theme. Here's the theme. God wants sons and daughters Amen. that are like Jesus. Amen. And the gospel tells us that the grace of God by the Spirit of Christ coming to live inside us, by the washing of the water of the Word and the renewing of our mind of the Word, that God by His Word, His living Word and by His Spirit is fully able to completely transform us and fill us with His love and His life and make us like Christ. That's the gospel. And that's what the Lord's after. Now let's look at some of it. In Ephesians chapter 1, beginning of verse 3, he said, you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let me just, I'll just read it. Ephesians 1 verse 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So you've already been blessed. How many are blessed? Yes. What do you have? I, everything you need. It's in Christ. Watch. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So you were chosen before you were born. How do you know you were chosen? If you want to be saved, you were chosen. I believe God chooses everybody. Some people say yes and some say no. He chose in him before the foundation of the world. Now, what did he choose us for? That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Love is what makes us blameless. Romans 13 says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is a fulfillment of the law. Right? Having predestined us to adoption, and you've heard me say this before, the word adoption is, in a Greek is weothesia. It doesn't mean like we think in the West, you go to an attorney, you go to an agency, you sign papers, and you bring a baby home, and now it's adopted in your family. That's not what this word means at all. There's four Greek words uh, translated son in the New Testament. Napios, infant, pation, toddler, technon, teenager, huios, fully mature son. Generally, not exactly, but generally. So a huios is a fully mature son who's been trained. We're told in the book of Galatians, a son, though he's the heir of all things, is no different than a slave. He's under tutors and governors. He's trained until the time appointed by the Father. So Jesus, it says, though he were a son, we're told in Hebrews, yet he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Jesus went through suffering, and it said that suffering made him perfect. Now, he was already morally perfect, always sinless. But what was he made perfect as? He had to be our intercessor and a perfect sacrifice. So he had to be tested in every way, yet without sin. So he suffered rejection, misunderstanding, temptation. He suffered all that without sin. He had to know the human condition. He had to know loneliness, misunderstanding, rejection, pain. He had to know all of it and not sin. He had to trust the Father. So he went through that experience and he was now perfectly qualified to be the spotless lamb, a sacrifice. And now because of his experience of the human condition, he's, he's, he says he, he suffered like us, yet without sin, he can be our perfect intercessor. He ever lives to make intercession. So Jesus, the captain of our salvation, was made perfect through suffering. And so will we. We will also be made perfect through suffering. If you try to, to go around the cross, you're only making the journey longer. You can't escape it. It's part of the plan. If you want to be a son or daughter of God, there's going to be some suffering involved. But it all works for good to those that are called according to his purpose. And so, um, so he's, now, when Jesus, at the end of 30 years, when he began his public ministry, he was baptized, the Holy Spirit came visibly 
you know, looked like a dove, rested upon him. God spoke audibly, this is my beloved son, Weos, in whom I'm well pleased. And he was, he was filled with the Holy Spirit and power and began his earthly ministry. He had, the, he had the checkbook, the car keys, the authority, the gun, the power. Right? Okay, what happened to him in his baptism and his commissioning to begin his public ministry with power is, is Weothesia. He was acknowledged as a father, as a fully mature son, authorized to do the kingdom business. Now, that's what this word means. It said, God has every person listening to me. I don't care if you were born again yesterday. You could be a brand new Christian. God has predestined you to Weothesia. To become fully mature. Now, predestined doesn't mean automatic. It means God's arranged everything. He set line things up so that if we'll cooperate, it'll come to pass. If, we, if we're stubborn, neglect, distracted, rebellious, it won't happen. We have to put our eyes on Jesus and run the race. And he'll make it happen. Okay, so there's number one. What's the theme that's gonna, we're going to see from beginning to end in the book of Ephesians? God's after fully mature sons and daughters of God. Yeah. Romans 8 said all of creation is waiting for them. The creation is waiting for mature sons and daughters. Other people that will be full of the Holy Spirit like Jesus. Creation is waiting. Okay, then we, then in the next part of chapter 1, the same chapter is when Paul prays the prayer. Because we're called to full maturity, he says, I pray God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of him. He'll flood your hearts with revelatory light and make you know the hope of his calling. Honestly, what I'm saying to you right now, probably the vast majority of the church has not heard this and doesn't even have a clue. Doesn't even have a clue. We've been sold a false gospel. It's only partly true. We just get our, our justification by faith. We're saved. We sing amazing grace. Amen. And God is a lifestyle enhancement to make sure that because I'm born again, he's going to help me figure everything out. He does do a, God does bless us, but that's not the main deal. The main deal is to make us like Christ. So you see it in chapter one. Then you see in chapter two, the same theme. Let's read chapter two. In whom, verse 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, by the way, I, did, I skipped a verse. If you go back to, when you go back to chapter 1, what a fully mature son or daughter eventually is going to be like is filled with all the fullness of God. Because at the end of chapter 1, and I'll come back to chapter 2 in a minute. He, when he prays, so now, Lord, because you're predestined to Weothesia, I pray your eyes will be open to see it. That's what, the, that's what the Ephesians 1, 17 through 20 prayer is. Help me, somebody. Amen. And then he says that God would show you the, the knowledge of him, the hope of his calling, the riches, the glory of his inheritance in you, and the exceeding greatness of his power that works in you who believe. The same power that was wrought when he raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities or powers or dominions or rulers, right? Yes. And made him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That's the last verse in Ephesians chapter 1. God calls his body, please hear this, God calls his body the fullness of Jesus. Now, we don't see that manifesting yet, but that's what's in God's heart. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. God calls his body, his plan for, now sadly, all the body won't do this. There's going to be some in the body that hear this and see it. And they'll say, Lord, like Mary, be it done unto me according to thy word. It's the only way we're going to get there is by faith. There are many people that don't see it. That's why we have to pray the apostolic prayers continually. That's what Ephesians 1 is. It's an apostolic prayer. The eyes of your heart flooded with light. 
So in chapter 1, it's fully mature sons of God and daughters of God that will eventually become filled. They will be, the body will be the fullness of Him who fills all and is in all. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> chapter 2. Chapter 2. In whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now we know that that dwelling place is all the fullness of God in a people on the earth. We know that is because in chapter 3, Paul says, for this reason. And the reason he's referring to is this verse. I bow my knee to the Father in heaven from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. That he would strengthen you with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ would live in your heart by faith. That you would be rooted in love and grounded in love. And you would be able to comprehend together with all the saints. The length and breadth and depth and height. And you would know the love of Christ that passes knowledge. Please hear this. So that you, the church, may be filled with all the fullness of God. So chapter 1 is real thesia, fully mature. The filled with the fullness of God. Chapter 2, the dwelling place of God where his fullness is. I'm telling you, if we'll keep on this path and keep praying the apostolic prayers and keep seeking the Lord, God's grace will raise up a people that are filled with the fullness of God. So chapter 2 is habitation. By the way, look at the verse in chapter 2, verse 21. You're being fitted together. Growing into a holy temple. And you're being built together. So how many want habitation of God's fullness? All right, what does it take? It takes fitting together and building together. Now what is fitting together? I'll give you an example. Not every member in the body is connected with every member, but we should all be connected. Meaning this, my foot is not connected to my elbow. It's connected to my ankle. Every part of my body is connected, but not every part's connected to every part. I'm fitted together. The foot goes down here. The hand goes here. Understand? That's why if we're going to redeem the time, every person needs to know their place. For the habitation, we have to be fitted together. For example, yesterday we had our house to house evangelism and teams of people. And I love the people in the body that I love everybody, but I'm blessed by the people that just want to obey the Great Commission. Amen. So we had some people come and we went house to house. We went to about a thousand homes with gospel literature. Others came in the sanctuary. And while they were out, they stayed in here and interceded. Yes, yes. That's, that's being fitted together. Yes, Not everybody can go out. But you got some praying and some going. Yes, you got some on the worship team, some in the kids' church. Yes, you got someone who's, who's a doctor at work being Christ out there. Yes. Yes. Every member... In their place, doing their job. Amen. So for habitation, we have to be fitted together. Where do you fit? Find out. And then, having fitted together, we're built together. And then we see in Philippians chapter 1, Paul said, whether I'm present or whether I'm absent and I hear of your affairs, I want to hear that you're walking worthy of the gospel of one mind and one spirit striving together for the faith of the gospel. Amen. So walking worthy of the Lord means we're fitted together, we're being built together, we're growing together, and we're striving together. Amen. Amen. Habitation. Yes, okay, that's chapter 2, chapter 3, fullness. Chapter 4, more full. Now what we're looking at in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way through is fullness fullness. So you'll know when we're 
When we pray these apostolic prayers, what we're praying into. How many want to pray into fullness? All right, chapter 4, verse 11. And he gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Now, here's an interesting thing. The word equipping in the Greek is used also when Jesus walked by the seashore and he saw James and John, the sons of Zebedee, mending their net. You know the word mending in the Greek? Same word used equipping. Interesting, isn't it? Did you know that you, every one of us, is the net? The, we're the net. And we're to be mended. Now, mending is where there's been a stress and there's been a tear. And you mend the net. That's the equipping. So the equipping of the saints has to do with, in other words, all of us can have relational friction at times. But we need to be mended. We need to be knit together. We need to be knit. In other words, the things in our heart that cause offense or criticism or I'm going to withdraw my affections or I'm going to put up a wall, those things have to be dealt with so that we can be knit together in love. So he said the fivefold ministry are given to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. For the building up of the body of Christ. Till we all, everyone say all, all. Come to the unity of the faith. Now notice there's a unity again. Fitted together. Built together. Growing together. He said now we all come to the unity of the faith. There's something synergistic that happens when every person does their part and we're connected. Synergy means this, that the, the total is greater than the sum of the parts. Three plus three plus three equals nine. But in synergy, three plus three plus three equals 900. So God says where the saints are together in unity, he commands the blessing. There's synergy. And the blessing, if you read Psalm 133, is the life of God's spirit. He said it's eternal life is what he commands. The eternal isn't speaking of the length of the life. It's the quality of the life. God commands the life of God in the midst of divine unity. The life of God fills the church. 1 John 4, 12. If we love one another, God dwells among us. So he said, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, the word is epinosis, to experiencing Christ, to a perfect man. There's that nasty word perfect again. <laughs> to a perfect man. To the measure, how perfect? To the measure of the stature of the fullness of, there's that word fullness again. Chapter one, fullness. Chapter three, fullness. Chapter 4, fullness. So God wants us, His body, to be complete. Perfect means complete and lacking no components. To the very measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We should no longer be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. And I hate to say this, but it's true. One of the reasons for the anemia of the body of Christ in general is because the cunning craftiness and deceitful plotting of preachers who craft messages to bring people back every week, but to not make them disciples. They craft with deceitful, cunning, plotting messages to get people to come back every week, but not to deny their self, take up their cross and be made like Jesus. Amen. And the root of all evil is money. Might as well say it. But speaking the truth may grow up in all things. There it is again. All things into him who is the head. How many want to grow up in all things into him? Amen. From whom the whole body joined and knit together. There it is again. 
Join and knit together by what every joint supplies. Now, a joint is where two hearts connect. Okay? If you go to Madeline Cell Group, if you're a lady and you go to Madeline Cell Group, and you go three or four times, you're going to start connecting with other women in her group. And you're, a love of Christ in you and the love of Christ in them is going to connect your heart. That forms a joint. Where hearts connect, when you go to Ed's group, or you go to the, in whatever, you're, if you're in there committed in the kid church, your heart starts getting connected. And when your heart is connected with other people, supply of the Spirit flows back and forth. Now, there's something very supernatural, please hear this, that happens when your heart's connected with people. Even when you don't see them, you can feel it. When you're, that's why everybody in the body needs to be connected. Because in the connection, the supply of the Spirit flows. When you're connected with somebody, you may not even see them for three days. If they're going through something, you'll feel it. You'll feel it. Oh, I got, I got to pray for Ed. I feel something's going on. See, how many feel stuff like that? It's because you're connected. Because we're members of one another. It's supernatural. God's in you and he's in the people you're connected with. So God designed that the body builds itself up in love. Every member doing its part. You don't want to have a beautiful jaguar have you seen the V12 Jag? Come on. With the wire spoke wheels. They make a Jaguar with a V12 engine. You know. You don't want to have a beautiful a beautiful Jaguar. And only three cylinders are working. <laughs> it's not funny. Because there's a lot of people in the body that are missing. They're MIA. They're AWOL. How can you be knit together if you don't even come together? How can you be fitted together unless you start serving together? If we got a 12-cylinder Jaguar that can get from here to there in under three seconds, then it's not going to work when only three cylinders are working. Every member does its part. And what's the it, what's it result? That we may, we may grow up in all things into Christ. Now the power of synergy is this. Paul wrote to Timothy. He said, pursue righteousness, faith, Love with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. It's being knit together, fitted together, praying together, striving together. for the. There's something supernatural. There's a synergy released by God. There's a, the blessing of God on the unity when the body strives together for the same faith of the gospel. Where that, that power is, is synergy. It's not the sum of the parts. It's not two or three hundred people. All. It's, it's the power of two or three thousand because God's in the midst. So in Ephesians 4, we see the body coming to the full stature of Christ. I'm almost done. Madeline said, keep going. You can blame her. Now let's look at chapter 5. I'm almost at chapter 6. There's only six chapters. How many see? Now when you look at this all through the, the book of Ephesians, the theme is all through the book. You're predestined. You are predestined to become like Christ. Not to be a church pew sitter. Not to be a Christian that's saved and is chasing the American dream. Listen, God... Chase God and God will add everything that you need. Yes. Seek first his key. He'll add to you. Listen, he'll give you the vacation that you need. I've never sought a vacation, but God's given them to me. 
He has. I was too busy to think about a vacation. I was obsessed with doing the will of God. And God would give me vacation every year. I'm telling the truth. Maybe that was bad on my part. I should have thought about it, but I didn't. I was ministering many, 20 some years ago. I was ministering in a church up in the Eastern Sierras. And the pastor said, we have a lodge up here. You and your family can come every year and stay for a week. There's my vacation. For years, every week, we'd go spend a week up in the mountains and go trout fishing. God provided that for me. I had a, a businessman from the Philippines. One time I was ministering in India. This is a dozen years ago at a conference. And there's a man in the hotel next to me from Philippines. And I told him, I'm going to the Philippines next month to speak in a large conference. And my wife told me, since we're flying that far, we shouldn't just go and do the work and then come right home. We should stay there an extra three or four days and take a little vacation. So I asked this man, I said, you're from the Philippines? He said, yes. I said, I've never been to the Philippines. My wife wants us to take a vacation while we're there. Do you have any suggestions? We're going to fly into Manila. I didn't know the man. I just met him. He said, well, when you come, I, didn't, I found out later he was on the board of the group that was inviting me to speak. <laughs> and he owns all these hotels. He has 1,100 employees. He said, well, you'll be staying at my hotel when you come. I said, oh, I will? Yes. He said, plan a few days. He said, we'll fly you over to a private island and we'll give you, he said, I own the vacation company. I own the tour company. He said, we'll, we'll have a vacation for you. And then later he said, bring your whole family. Bring your whole family. We'll give you a vacation. So we did. We did. We went back a few years later, my whole family. Jet skis, private island, eating lobster. <laughs> eating lobster. We had our own ballroom, special feast. These are our friends. Never sought it. I'm not going. Those are the blessings that chase you. We're to chase God. He said, these blessings will overtake you, it says. I'm not looking for the blessings. I'm looking to walk with the blesser. Seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added to you. So anyway, so now we're in chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And look, look at how Christ loved the church. He gave himself for her. <sighs> Christ gave himself for the church. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, here it is, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That sounds like mature image of Christ, doesn't it? Fullness. So there's the theme again. Why did Christ give himself? So that she would, yes, we miss hell. But that's just the first part. That he, he gave himself to us that we might give ourselves over to the washing of the word. That's what's happening right now while you're sitting under the word. And the washing of the word sanctifies us. It changes our mind. It changes our perspective. And it cleanses us. So that why? What's the goal? He wants to present to himself you, a glorious you, without spot or wrinkle. He wants you to be holy and without blemish, and he's well able to do it. The blood of Jesus can wash away every stain. The living word and the fire of the Holy Spirit can break every bondage. And Romans 5, 5 says the love of God is poured into our heart by the Holy Spirit. Now, let me try to close. This is the theme, chapter 1. 
fully mature son. Chapter 2, filled with the fullness of God, habitation. Chapter 3, same thing, filled with God. Chapter 4, growing up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How many see the theme? Chapter 5, washed in the water the word so that you're holy and pure and glorious. I looked up the word glorious. It means shining with glory. No spots, no wrinkles. Pure, holy, glorious like Christ. Now, now just like in Hebrews, when he gave his whole theme, then at the end he culminated. And he said, now may the God of peace who brought up Jesus from the dead make you perfect. He's now going to finish in chapter 6. You're called to be a fully mature son of God. You're seated in the heavenlies with him. You're called to be his habitation. You're called to be filled with all of his fullness. You're called to be washed in the, to grow up into the measure, the stature, of the fullness of Christ. Being knit together, being fitted together, growing together. You're called to be washed in the water of the word until you're glorious and without spot or wrinkle. How in the world do we get there? By grace through faith. And we access grace by prayer. So he said, now, finally, brethren. So now that we know what we're called to be, he said, finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on all the armor of God. And then take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray with all perseverance for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given me to open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Okay, this is the, the psalm of the book of Ephesians for fullness, maturity, what, all of it, is all the saints, all the saints, read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, 18, 19, all the saints take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's what these apostolic prayers are. There's other swords. Take the Word of God and pray with all perseverance for all the saints. And then pray for me that wisdom, revelation, and utterance will be given to you to make known the mysteries of the gospel. And that, that, su that sustenance that you're being fed will strengthen you. All the saints praying with all perseverance for all the saints. All the saints praying Ephesians 1. Lord, give everyone in this body the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Flood their hearts with revelatory light. Let them know the riches, the hope of your calling, the riches of the glory of your inheritance in them, the exceeding greatness of your power that works in them. Pray Ephesians 3. That's another apostolic prayer. God, I pray for everyone in this body to be given the impartation, the revelation, the, the revelation to their heart of the love of God that passes knowledge so they can be filled with all the fullness of God. He's, now, how do we get grace? We are what we are by grace. We get grace by using the means of grace. And the means of grace is prayer. We access grace by faith. So we say, God, this is your promise. Release it to your body. And we do it with all perseverance. Every day, every day. From now till Jesus comes back. From now till Jesus comes back. I want to be among a body that's praying night and day. We sang it today. Night and Jesus said men ought to pray always and not to faint. Rejoice always. Pray constantly. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So now we pray things like this. God like in 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians. First, it says, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 5. Now may God direct your heart into the love of God and the patience of Christ. I've experienced this, and I'm sure you have. I've, I've experienced the grace of God where you're in a situation. Maybe there's financial, uh, maybe there's relational friction. You're not sure what to do. How do I handle this? I know I'm supposed to walk in love. I don't know what to do. Here's the prayer. May now may God direct your heart into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. If all of us are praying for all of us every day for, for these things, the grace of God's going to be directing your heart. Amen. Now may God make you increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, that God may establish your heart 
blameless in holiness. There's a good definition of holiness. It means love. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Did you know that one prayer would cause a revival? May, watch this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know if we'll all start praying that fervently every day for all of us, God will answer it. And the church will start getting full of hope. What's going on? I'm having dreams. I'm having revelation. Holy Spirit's meeting me in the shower. He's meeting me all day long. How do you feel? I feel full of hope. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy, all peace in believing that you may overflow in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have what these apostolic prayers are. The way we get there, Paul said, the way we get to fullness is we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we pray with all perseverance for all the saints. That's why we see in the book of Acts, the church was like it was. Let me, let me uh, that was my first finish. This is my second finish. <laughs> See, in the book of Acts, it said they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Did they? And fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Now, I would suggest that whatever they were praying was probably according to the apostles' doctrine that they were continuing in. They were continuing in the teaching of the apostles and they were praying all the time. Now, if you, no, we have 25 or 26 recorded apostles' prayers in the New Testament. I believe they, were, they prayed. It said, here's how they prayed. Steadfastly, daily, continuously, and in one accord. Those are the adjectives used in the book of Acts. Steadfastly, daily, continuously, one accord. In Luke 24, it says they went to the temple and they were continuously in the temple praising God. They praised him every day. They prayed every day. They continued steadfastly, continuously, in one accord, praising God and praying. I believe they were praying according to what they were taught by the apostles. And so what do we see? We see a church filled with glory. We see a church filled with fire. We see a church that when they gathered to pray, the whole place shook. And a, and a river of signs and wonders flew, flowed. This is what we have to recover. Every part doing their share. All 12 cylinders working. Everybody. I'm, I was so blessed by the people that came out yesterday to go evangelize and other people that came and prayed. But I would love to see more cylinders involved. If you can. Not everybody can. But find where you're fitted and fit. I'll tell you about a, a move of God. How many want to hear about a move of God? I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> Anybody hear about the move of God that happened in Melody Land in the 70s? Yeah. It's a, it's a church. It doesn't exist now. But Ralph Wilkerson was a pastor in uh, Orange County. There was such a move of God, of God's glory, resting on the church Melody Land back in the 70s. Now, I, I wasn't there personally, but I talked to different people that were there personally, and they gave me their reports. One of them was Al Houghton who used to go there. Mario Murillo is another I talked to. He grew up there. When he was 18 years old, he was, that's where the church he was going to, at Melody Land. Mario's in his, I think, late 60s now, maybe 70. But uh, there was so much of God's presence resting on Melody Land that every Friday night they had an average of 1,000 people saved every Friday. Average, Friday after Friday. I was told by Al Houghton, who was there, he said every Friday they would fill up a pickup truck bed load full of crutches, canes, wheelchairs, knives, guns, and drugs that were thrown on the altar after people were saved, healed, and delivered. Every Friday they'd take a pickup truck full of crutches, wheelchairs, canes, drugs, knives, guns, marijuana that people threw on the altar after they got saved, healed, and delivered. And I asked him, what in the world, how did that happen? Here's what I was told by Al Houghton. He said there was a, they had 
He said their prayer meeting was as full as their Sunday morning service. And there was a lady, no relation to Kenneth Hagin, an elderly saint named Mrs. Hagin, and she led the intercessory prayer. And it was as packed, it was a big church. It was as, the prayer meetings were as packed full as a Sunday morning. He said that's why the glory was there. They said it was not uncommon for people when they heard about a move of God to drive up to the church, get out of their car, and in the parking lot be smitten by the power of the Holy Spirit. They said people would fall to their knees, repent, get saved, get filled with the Holy Spirit, start speaking in tongues, and walk into the church saved and, and filled. Why, why did that happen? When you have extraordinary prayer, you have extraordinary move of God. When you have weak prayer, you have a weak move. Every move of God is prayer. Amy Semple McPherson in the 1920s. She had a church of 20,000 members right here in Los Angeles. I have a black and white picture in my office of what she called her stretcher days. She would call days. She says, today's a stretcher day. This is coming Friday. And ambulances from all over the city would bring all their sick. And I have pictures. All the people lying on stretchers. She'd walk and, and touch them and about 80 or 90% of them would get up healed. And, uh, and so the, someone, now reporters that were critical of her, skeptics came. This is what was reported. It's what I read. The reporter came in and said, she has to have, why when she touches people, they fall down. She must be wired up with electric wire or something. And uh, the usher said, no. He said, yeah, I'm sure there has to be a secret generator, something around here. Uh, and, he, and the usher said, she does have a generator. I'll show it to you. So the reporter said, oh, I'm going to have a story. He took him outside the church, took him to the back, opened the door, went down into the basement. There was 150 people down there praying. He said, there's the generator right there. Now, if you're preaching with 150 people praying for you, you better be able to preach good. Right? Reinhard Bonnke is great massive outdoor evangelistic campaigns in Africa. He would have it, he would for weeks and weeks in advance, he'd have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people praying. He said during his meeting, he'd have a tent on the side with five to 600 intercessors on their knees, groaning and praying the whole time he's preaching. So when he stood on the platform and he said, be filled. Anybody see that? See 10,000 people slain in the spirit. You've got five or 600 people over here praying. Amen. Prayer goes up, heaven comes down. Come Amen. See, in the days of Charles Finney, let me read this quote, and this is a closing. Charles Finney was used, he and Father Nash, to lead the greatest. We still haven't seen a revival like they saw, the Great Awakening. We will. We'll see one greater. Where's my paper? Here's what Charles Finney says. I wrote it down. He prayed. They would go to churches and teach churches how to pray. They would pray for the conviction of sin, for the awakening of the church, for consecration, for holiness, and obedience to evangelize. Charles Finney said, revival is a renewed conviction of sin and repentance, followed by an intense desire to live in obedience to God. It's giving up one's will to God in deep humility, and it comes by prayer. So when they would, saints would pray, God would release his presence, and he would bring to pass a revival in the people. Charles Finney said the presence of God was so strong at times when he would preach after all this prayer that went on, he said, if I raised my voice above a whisper, people would be cut out of their seat. It looked like someone came, took a sword and knocked them all out of their seats. The piece of the power of God was so strong, I had to speak in the mildest tone. If I raised my voice, they'd all get knocked out of their seats. I mean, no, we need, there's more power than we, we're experiencing now. So that's why I'm encouraging us. I'm not going to back up, let up, get diverted or give up. But I'm going to stay on 
what God said to do. Amen. What God's plan is for the church to grow up, right? Into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And the way we do it is we all take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we pray with all perseverance. Amen. Amen. Prayer goes up, heaven comes down. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. Come on and give God praise. <laughs>